Hello, I'm Fred Dynage, and I'm talking to you about crime and gangsters and killers. And we're talking about the Cray twins, Ronnie and Reggie Cray. If you remember, on March the 8th, 1969, in the Old Bailey, they were found guilty of murder, and the judge, Justice Melford Stevenson, said to the Cray twins, I'm not going to waste time with you. Society needs a break from your activities. I sentence you to life imprisonment, which I recommend be no less than 30 years. It was an astonishing sentence and it really sent shockwaves throughout London's criminal underworld. So who did the Cray twins kill and why did they do it? Well, Ronnie killed a gangster called George Cornell. Now, the irony of this is that Cornell had been a very close friend of Ronnie Cray and indeed had been a member of the Cray gang, a tough man. Then he met a girl from, the, from South London, from across the River Thames, and decided to move in with her. And it seemed easier for him then to join the Richardson gang, Charlie and Eddie Richardson, the so-called torture gang, who were the big rivals of the Cray twins, big enemies of the Cray twins at the time. Ronnie Cray took that defection badly. He felt that George Cornell had let them down. However, that wasn't enough to kill him, of course. And then there was a meeting between the Crays and the Richardsons and a couple of members of the American Mafia who were keen to build up their interests in London. It was important that the Richardsons and the Crays got on well together so they could do a big business deal with the Mafia. But of course the meeting at a very posh London hotel ended in acrimony and shouting and arguing. And George Cornell is alleged to have called Ronnie Cray a big fat puff. That went down very badly with Ronnie Cray, and he vowed he'd get revenge. Then, one night, there was a big altercation at a club called Mr Smith's in Catford between the Cray twins and the Richardsons, and a lad called Richard Hart, who was a cousin of the Cray twins and a member of the Cray gang, was shot and killed. Again, George Cornell had been involved in that. The next night, George Cornell travelled to a hospital in the east end of London, where Several members of his gang were in hospital. He came to visit them. And then when he left the hospital, for some inexplicable reason, he decided to go for a drink at a pub called The Blind Beggar in Whitechapel, in the middle, in the heart of Cray Twins' territory. Ronnie Cray got a phone call to say that George Cornell was drinking at The Blind Beggar. Immediately, he and two members of the Cray gang drove round to The Blind Beggar. As they walked in, on the jukebox, the Walker Brothers song, The Sun Ain't Gonna Shine Anymore, was playing. And Ronnie Cray said to me, when he heard that, he, he thought to himself, the sun ain't gonna shine for you anymore, George Cornell. And he walked up to George Cornell. Cornell looked at him. Cornell was having a drink at the bar. Cornell looked at him and said with a bit of a sneer, well, look who's here. Ronnie Cray took out a gun, fired it, and shot George Cornell in the forehead between his eyes, shot him dead. Freddie Foreman, a Cray henchman, of course, and one of their most important members of the Cray gang, Freddie Foreman said to me, it was a miracle, really, that Ronnie Cray hit him between the eyes because he said Ronnie was as blind as a bat and he said the bullet could actually have gone anywhere. But it was, of course, a fatal bullet. There were several drinkers in the pub and the barmaid. One of the Cray associates fired a gun four or five times and all of the people in that bar were warned not to say anything about it at all, otherwise there would be severe retribution. Ronnie Cray walked out. He was driven to a pub where he kept some separate clothing. He washed, he changed, went downstairs and was happily drinking without apparently a care in the world. The police came, of course, later that night. He was taken into custody. There was an identity parade where several of the drinkers in the pub and the barmaid came through, but nobody, of course, identified Ronnie Cray because that would have been a very dangerous thing to do. So Ronnie Cray was out. He was apparently free. And Ronnie sort of thought, now I'm invincible. The Cray twins, the, the police can't touch us. We can do whatever we want. I've committed murder. I'm safe. I can do whatever I want. Little knowing that a Scotland Yard detective called Leonard Nipper-Reed was already on the trail of the Cray twins and gradually 
he was going to build up enough evidence to actually nail them and put them behind bars. But the problem here was that Ronnie Cray then went to Reggie and said, look, I've done one. Now you've got to do one. In other words, I've killed someone. You've got to kill someone. But Ronnie had mental health problems. He was a paranoid schizophrenic. So he was a dangerous man. He needed help, really. But Reggie had no such problems. Reggie had no intention of killing anyone. Of the two of them, Reggie was the better businessman. Reggie would have done extremely well as a businessman. So he didn't want to kill. But Ronnie kept on. I've done one. Now you've got to do one. So Reggie decided he was going to kill Jack the Hat McVitty, known as the Hat, because he always wore a hat to cover his bald head. A tough little man, a fringe member really of the Cray gang, but he'd go and collect money for them, protection money that was owed to them. And they felt he was cheating them. He was keeping money from them and putting it in his own pocket. Indeed, he'd been heard to say, I've turned the Cray twins over. So he was invited to what he was told was a party at a flat of a girl called Blonde Carol. Of course, it wasn't a party and Blonde Carol wasn't even there. She'd been sent away. And when Jack the Hat McVitie arrived and walked into the room, he found the Cray twins and several of their associates waiting for him. He was dragged across to a chair and held in the chair. Reggie Cray took out a gun and tried to fire it, but the gun didn't go off. The gun jammed. Jack the Hat saw this as his opportunity to escape and tried to dive through a window. And because he was a bulky little fellow, he got stuck in the window frame. He was pulled back into the room, held back in the chair. Reggie Cray took out a knife and stabbed him to death. What happened to the body? No one really is quite sure, although it's been suggested that the body was taken to New Haven and thrown into the sea. So Reggie Cray had now killed a man as well. And again, this time there were no witnesses. But nonetheless, several members of the Cray gang were now becoming a little bit scared because they'd seen what had happened to Cornell. They'd seen what had happened to one of their own, Jack the Hat McVitty, and they became a little bit unnerved, a little bit frightened, thinking, well, if that could happen to them, it could happen to me as well. And then Leonard Nipper Reed, the Scotland Yard detective, really pounced on this and gradually persuaded one or two of the members of the Cray gang to give evidence against them. He also persuaded the barmaid at the Blind Beggar to give evidence against the Cray twins. And in exchange for that, she would get a new address and a totally new identity. So suddenly the Cray twins weren't infallible. Suddenly the Cray twins weren't going to rule London for any longer because Leonard Nipper Reed had got his witnesses he got them, he arrested them, they were taken to the Old Bailey and sent down for life, not less than 30 years. It was an incredible sentence. So how well did the Cray twins do behind bars? How did they survive that long time behind bars? How did I come to meet them? What sort of guys were they really? What sort of things did they tell me? This is what I'm going to be telling you in forthcoming broadcasts. Thank you for joining me. Hope you'll join me next time.